As we've come into the new month of August, we have also come into a new theme. You know, as we always do, we like to get into themes and just uh, share the same thing. What is shared here is what we are also going through over at our Mirema campus. And so we are looking at a new theme. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at Christian spiritual disciplines, all right? Christian spiritual disciplines. And so today I'm just going to be running an overview of it. I'm going to be looking at the importance of Christian spiritual disciplines, at the importance of Christian spiritual disciplines. I'm reading from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. Because it's a bit cold this morning, I'm going to invite you to read together with me aloud. Are you ready? All right, it's on the screen. We're reading in the New King James Version. And the Bible says, 1, 2, 3, now the Spirit, in the latter times, some will depart from their faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in a hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. All right. And that is the word of the Lord. The boarding primary school that I went to was an ACK school. And so every time we said that is the word of the Lord, we used to say thanks be to God. All right. Um, Thanksgiving right there. Okay. So um, looking at the importance of um, Christian spiritual disciplines. Now we're taking it from um, the first letter of Paul to his son Timothy. And Paul is writing to his son Timothy and he's instructing him. Now Timothy is largely also an instructional letter. He's writing to let him know how he ought to carry out his ministry, how he ought to carry himself as Paul now is towards the end of his life. He's just about to exit the scene, not just of ministry, even the end of his life. So he writes his valedictory at the end, his speech at the end of his life, talking about I have ran the good race and I have fought the fight and I have kept the faith. And now there is laid up for me a crown of life, which is not just for me, but for also those who believe. Now, Paul has lived his life. He's doing ministry. But now he's handing over the work of ministry to his son, Timothy. And so he's giving a lot of instruction to this son of his. One of those instructions or a portion of these instructions is what we're looking at here today. He says now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now remember we're looking at the importance of Christian spiritual disciplines, all right? We're going to be breaking those words in just about a minute, but I want us to look at what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying the Spirit expressly says, I like to think every time I'm reading the word or every time I'm reading a letter, it matters to me who says some words. A good example would be when we had COVID and you guys would remember there was a time that we have lived through curfews in this nation. Do you remember that? And there were times that the CS was he Kagwe at that time. The CS would come and he would say, my fellow Kenyans. And he would tell us many things about the number of people who have been new infections. And he would tell us from now on we are imposing a curfew that will begin at this time and will end at this time. Now there are times that the curfew was at 10. Other times the curfew was at 9. Other times it was at 8. There are times that the curfew was at seven. You are seven. Najua ilipata wengine wenu inje na mkajipata on the other side of the law. But that is not what we are talking about here. Now, there were also people during social media, uh, on social media during that season, who would come in and they would say, by the way, the curfew is changing. Now we are no longer meeting from, we are no longer, um, the curfew is not starting uko 10 in the night. Now it is starting at seven. 
We did not change because some person on social media has decided they want to change it. True or true. We decided we will wait until we hear the official address. Why? Because it matters who is delivering something. Quelly see quelly. I we were sharing the other day and we were saying that if um, it is the people who, my mom likes to say, it is the people who you love the most that will hurt you the most. Growing up, she used to tell us that. And that just to prepare us for life as an adult. Because life as an adult, as you know, and some of you are parents in this place, you know that sometimes that your children will do the most hurtful things. They will say the most hurtful things to you. You know, for those of you who are married, that it is your spouse that has the ability to hurt you the most. Those of you who are not married and you have friends, you know it is your best friend that can hurt you the most. Sinikweli, if me, as your pastor, when we meet outside there, I just tell you, you're such a useless person. Oh, your heart will be broken. You'll go home thinking, why could he have told me that? Was it a word from the Lord? Is it that he's so in discernment? But if the conductor of the matatu you just met this morning, as you're alighting, tells you, hey, nimtubure kabisa, will you think about it past lunchtime? Because he doesn't know you. You don't know him. You just take it as nothing. Why? Because it matters who says something. Now Paul is writing here to Timothy. Says to him, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Now there are many things that Paul would say. And in his writing, throughout the writing to the churches, he would say that this is my own. Mimi ndio ninawambia. And then there are things that he would say, this is what the Lord says. Some of the things he would quote from the previous prophets that have come through, that we know about in the scriptures. But now on this one, he's saying the spirit expressly says. When he says somebody has expressly said something, it means that they have laid emphasis on what it is that they are saying. So these are words that you should, in other words, he would say to Timothy, these are words that you should actually place weight on. These are words that carry something. He says to him, the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving doctrines, to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, in the latter times is, was not a particular season, not a particular number of years. It was a length or it was, um, it was a length of time. Those latter times that we would say we are also living in. If you look at the things that he's talking about, then you realize we truly are living in those latter times. Quelly see quelly. He says that there will be certain dangers that are coming. The danger of apostasy. Um, apostasy is departing. So he says that some will depart. He says there's also another danger of deception. He says there will be deceiving spirits. And he says there's another danger of false teaching, which is the doctrine of of demons. Now he says, in those times, some will depart from the faith. When he says from the faith, we are not talking about um, the, uh, the ability to believe in God. He's not saying that a time is coming that people will stop believing in God. It's not the inability to, to trust or to believe in God. He's saying that in those days, that a time was going to be coming where people will, will um, not follow what is supposed to be followed. The faith, we're talking about the Christian faith in general. A time is going to come and we are seeing that we are living in those times that people are going to depart from that which is true, that which is right, that which has been handed down to us, that which is able to preserve the souls of men. People will depart from those things. Now, we see that we are living in those days because if you look around the world that we are living in today, if you look around your office, your home, you look around the screen, social media, you wonder sometimes, how did we get here? Sometimes you turn on the TV and you want to ask yourself, how did we get here? When Pastor Mulo was leading us today this morning and he was asking that the Lord would take us back to that place of glory, the glory of the church, that place where the Lord has called um, Kenya to be, that those prophecies that have been made concerning this nation, it is going back because right now it seems like we have veered off where we are supposed to be. Now he says those days will come that some will depart from the faith. It, is, it talks about losing the content of what Christians should believe. That is what departing from the faith also means. Losing the content of what Christians should believe. These are the Christian spiritual doctrines that we are talking about. Those are the things that make us us. Those are the things that make believers 
believers. Those are the things that make Christians Christians. I don't know whether you have been in a place or you have watched a movie and somebody is saying, we are the Mwashigadis. The Mwashigadis don't give up. The thing that characterizes the Mwashigadis as a family is that they don't give up, is what that statement would mean. Sinikweli. Now, if you look at your family, there are things that characterize your family. For instance, let me try and bring it close to some of you who are parents. If you, uh, your home used to run like our home, my mom used to tell us, um, hapani, oh, you guys know it, hapani, hapani kwangu, hapa kwangu, watu hawaingi masa ile wanataka. And I think you have to set those rules when you are a parent. Kwa sababu watoto wanaeza wakakalia, sindio? Hey, unasema hapa kwangu, mtu, nikisha ingia, nikifunga mlango. Hakuna mtu anafaku <laughs> kukuta after mimi. Sini kweli. Sama, hapa kwangu, watu hawakunyuagi pombe. Hapa kwangu. Mwenye anataka kukunywa pombe, hayuko hapa. Sindio. What you're saying is that these are the things that characterize this family. Hapa kwangu, tunaombanga pamoja. Kwa hivyo kama hautaki kuomba pamoja, hayuko hapa. Kwangu. The things that make us, us. Now, as believers, there are things that characterize us. For instance, a believer is known by their study, by their reading of the word, by their study of the word. A believer is known by their prayer life. Those are the fruits that we will see. If we want to know you are a Christian, how will we know? Not by the way you talk about it. We will know it by the fruits that we see. We shall know them by their Fruit, we shall be able to know, that's a saying, um, applied of course in different ways, but really, we, shall, we should be able, we ought to know you by the kind of person that you are, by your character. In English, they used to tell us, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. We know it by the character that it has. That is the importance of the Christian spiritual doctrines. It is that these are the things that make us, us. When um, Jesus is writing the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, I think, he's writing to the letters in the churches and he's speaking to them. And he's saying to them, I know your works. To some of them he's saying they are, they are neither hot nor cold. He says, you are lukewarm, so I will spew you out of my mouth. Now he's writing the letters to them to tell them, some of them he tells them, consider the heights from which you have fallen. Because as my people, you ought not to live the way you are living. There's supposed to be hotness inside of the life of a believer. You burn up because one of the depictions of the Holy Spirit is fire. So when you have received the Holy Spirit, even in the early days when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2, is it? The Bible says there appeared upon them like cloven tongues of fire. That is one of the characterization of the Holy Spirit. He comes upon you and it's like you are set on fire. You cannot sit on the message. You have to go out and share with somebody. Another practice, one of the I'm, I'm looking at some, I'm mentioning some of the examples of the Christian disciplines that we'll be looking at over the next few weeks. One of them is witnessing that you are on fire. You cannot just be silent. It characterizes a believer when you are telling other people about Jesus. Christ. That is the whole essence of the Great Commission. Sinikweli. Sinikweli. Matthew chapter 28, is it 19? When Jesus is speaking to them, he's telling them, go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing people, making disciples of me, and go into Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to all the ends of the earth. He says, go ye. He says to them, do not be afraid because I am with you even to the end of the age. Witnessing. Those are the things that characterize a believer. So in other words, we should be able to say, if these things are not in you, then you are missing the mark. That we ought to be that way. I remember a time in 2019, and um, we, we traveled to the U.S. together with Bishop and Pastor Alice and another team of ministers from, from here, and we were going to attend some conferences there. Um, now, I happened to travel before everybody else, so I traveled alone. When I traveled... Uh, it had been a long week. So I was tired. So when I arrived, when, when, when I got to the airport and I, I, I got onto the plane, it was a long, long, it was a long commute because I was supposed to be traveling for 22 hours. So I had a nine-hour flight and then I think a six-hour layover in Amsterdam and then a nine-hour flight again to Atlanta. 
Now, when I got onto the flight, when I got onto the first flight, um, the nine-hour flight, the first one, I got in and there was a young Muslim lady and she had her child. I could tell she was Muslim because of the way she was dressed. We're talking about the things that characterize a people, the lifestyle of a people. So even though she was not Muslim, just because I looked at the way she was dressed, I was like, ah, yeah, this one is Muslim. Do you understand? Those things that we are talking about, those disciplines, even the way we dress should be able to tell this person has modesty. It should be a, dis a, a discipline. That when I look at you, I can tell, oh, you know, there are, there are people that you can look at and you are not judging them. You're just looking at the kind of fruit they're bearing. And somebody, of course, will tell you, especially the younger generation, my generation and younger, they will tell you, you're judging me. But sometimes we are not really judging. We're just looking at the fruit. See, I cannot look at a mango tree and then I say, I, I cannot see mangoes dangling from a tree and say, oh, this is a mango tree. And then the mango says to me, you are judging me. I can't because I'm just looking at what is there and I'm thinking if there are mangoes that are dangling, then this is highly likely a mango tree. There are things that should not be characterized. They should not be part of a believer's life. So anyway, I was on the flight and I got in. I thought, um, she looked like a Muslim because of the way she was dressed. And she sat there. I got in. I said hi. And she said hi back and I sat down. Those were the only words I spoke on that nine-hour flight. The only other two words were when the ladies were coming, the flight attendants, and they would be like, beef or chicken, and I would say beef. And they would come again, and they would ask, I don't know for what, I think we ate like twice. Or, well, I personally ate many times. There were snacks in the back, so I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a lot of, uh, of eating and movement, but I did not say, I don't think I spoke four words on that flight until we arrived. And I disembarked and I got into the airport in Amsterdam. And for six hours, I plugged in. I remember there was a memo that was happening. So I tuned into the memo uh, and I watched the memo for the, I think, one hour that it happened. The remainder of the five hours, I think I largely ate. I ate in like 10 different restaurants at that place because I was eating to kill time. And I did not speak to anybody apart from the people that were serving me, asking me, what would you have? And I'd make my order and they would pack it. And that was it for six hours. And then I got onto the other flight. The one I got onto, the nine-hour flight, the second one, I got in and there was nobody that I found in my seat, in that seat. And then the two people that came, one of them said hello. It was a bulky man sat next to me and another one was a lesser bulky man. He, the one said hi to me, the other one said nothing. And we just sat. And for nine hours, this one slept, this one read a book the whole time. I slept also a lot. And I didn't speak a word apart from before chicken, and I said chicken for variety this time. And that was the flight, and I got to... So from Kenya, when I said hello to the people that dropped me at the airport, when I got there, I think I had spoken a total of ten words. And then I got there. Now, this is 2019. I was a pastor. I had been doing ministry by that time for about three years. And I disembarked and I went in and I uh, met my host and I was there for two weeks. And then when I was coming back, it was the same long haul again. Nine hours, six hours, nine hours again. And when I came, uh, when I came back, I think um, one of the people who we had the first conversations with was my mom. And I remember her asking me, how was it? How was the experience? You know, I was just telling her how it was. Did you make friends on the flight? <laughs> and I said, I, I, there was a lady, a Muslim lady. I said hi, but she was like for nine hours. And then I'm like, okay, and the six hour layover, did you meet new people? Who could say hi? I said, um, no, I didn't talk to anyone. And the other nine hour flight, I said, no. <laughs> My mom was so disappointed. <laughs> she couldn't understand how I got an opportunity to sit. Kwanza, I think she was thinking, there was a Muslim lady. Mungu wa mekushikia hivi. Unajua hizi enda maali? For nine hours. Hizi enda maali, ni atasikia ujumbe. Biblia inasema. <laughs> she couldn't understand that I passed up that opportunity. At that time, I just thought, see me, I'm introverted. You know, I just like to keep to myself. But then, when she pointed it out, that thing has haunted me since then. These days, I will sit in a place and I want to be silent, but then I remember that as a believer, I ought to be a witness. 
I ought to, t because what is witnessing? It is one beggar who has found the bread, telling another beggar where you have found the bread. To not witness is to be selfish, is to refuse. If I have experienced a good life in Jesus Christ, then I ought to tell somebody else, man, I have found something great. I think you would benefit from it too. Those are some of the Christian disciplines. They characterize us. So if you're not doing them, if you're not praying, if you're not reading the word, if every time when you meet with somebody inside of you, there is no word of life that you can share with them, then I think you're doing a great disservice. You are, it, is, it would be wrong for us to call you a Christian because then you are not doing the things that you ought to be doing. Now listen, the spiritual disciplines are practices that can design to, they, they are designed to, live to, to lead to a transformation of our lives. If we practice these things, they can transform our lives and not just ours, they can transform the lives of the people around us. They help us to create time and space for transformation. Pastor Alice likes to say the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. And so if you practice these things, they create room and space for you to be transformed. The Bible says, do not therefore be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewal of your mind. Now, every time we practice these spiritual disciplines, they renew our minds, they transform us. That's why they're important. When you open your Bible to read it, when you take time to study the word of God, it renews you. It transforms you to be what? A Christ-like person. To be more like Jesus Christ. Tell your neighbor it's important. We cannot neglect it. Every time you witness with, to somebody, you're, you're, you're practicing a Christian doctrine, you, or a, a Christian discipline, sorry, a spiritual discipline. As you witness to somebody, every time you do it, it transforms you because it makes you more like Christ, but it also transforms them because it gives them information that can transform their lives forever. So we are saying that every time you practice them, they create time and space and room for transformation. These are the believer's practices that aid our spiritual growth. They make us better. They make you stand out. I want you to look at your life. In Sunday school, they used to tell us, read your Bible, pray every day. If you want, if you actually do those things, you'll realize your life, you grow. You're not the same way you are before you started reading the word, are you? When you started reading the Bible, things change. Every time you go into the place of reading the word, you, you read the word of God, and reading and studying are different. You read the word, it makes you different. You just, you are discouraged, you read the word, you realize, ha, ah, your spirit is lifted. I know many of you have had that experience when your heart has been so broken and you go to the scriptures and you find that somehow your heart has been lifted. Sinequeli. Sometimes you're in confusion and you read the word and somehow the light appears upon your path when you read the Bible. To study is to take a little bit more time to get into it. As you practice them, they, these are the, the believer's practices. As you practice them, they aid your spiritual growth. They are like training exercises for the spiritual life. All right? You see, the, the, the way we do physical exercise, those of you who go to the gym, you go to, maybe you don't go to the gym, but maybe you do exercises, you stretch, you do some home workouts and so on and so forth. The same way when you're going to the gym or when you're doing physical exercise, you have to choose. It is a choice. You have to choose to do them regularly if you're going to see an impact in your life. The same way if you have one meal, one great meal, one great meal, I'm sure if you take some time, if you take just a few seconds and remember the best meal you have ever had, just think about it. If this were the youth service, the, the, the choices of meals would really differ because they would just be thinking about such greasy, unhealthy, fatty foods. But here, I'm sure many of us are thinking, Sijui Matoke, Sijui Giveri. <laughs> we were sat somewhere on Friday with somebody, and she was telling us, you know, Gaveri is such a balanced diet. We were in a high school, and so she was, she was a teacher. She was telling us, you know, Gaveri is such a balanced diet. I don't know why the children don't like it. It has carbohydrates. It has proteins. It has uh, vitamins in the vegetables. I'm like, I know, but we don't want it. 
<laughs> we know all those things. Just get, give us another balanced diet. Anyway, if you think about a meal that you really enjoyed, that meal was great. In fact, maybe it was loaded with all the things you need to sustain you. But that is not the meal that has kept you alive today. True or true? The meals that have kept us alive, we are sustained by small, insignificant, mundane meals that we don't even remember. By the Ugali and Sukumawiki that you ate the other day and the half cup of mala that you ate the other day. There was nothing to write home about it. It was bland. Maybe it wasn't even properly salted. But it gave you nutrients to live another day. The Githeri, the Njahe, those things that people say hardware foods. Umilikula Njahe, ata ilikuwa imekauka, ulikuwa unanyongwa, ata lakini ilikupatia nutrients za kuishi siku nyingine, sikweli. There was nothing to write home about. In fact, if your visitors come, you will not prepare that food for them because there's nothing to write home about that meal. But it kept you and sustained you. In the very same way, these spiritual disciplines, if we practice them, we have to practice them regularly. If you're going to be Christ-like, if you're going to grow, if you're going to be mature believers that are strong, there has to be a regular practice of them. If it is the word, we have to keep consuming the word over and over and over again. It can't be one meal in the revival. I came in and I listened to the word, boom, the, mass, the preacher was preaching, I tell you. You're telling everybody, wow, 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 you should have been here. That revival, woo, 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 that word was heavy. That word was heavy, great. But that word is not enough to make you like Jesus. You must keep reading and studying and reading and studying. If it is prayer, just one Kesha is not enough. It is great. It will move you a few inches. But it is not enough. You need to pray and pray and pray. If you're going to be like Jesus, if you're going to hear what Jesus is saying, the importance of spiritual doctrines is that if they're going to transform you, you have to make a choice. Just like physical exercise, you have to make a choice. Somebody said, a call Scott Jose said that you work out your salvation, you train yourself, not in order to get saved, but because you already are. You work out your salvation and you train yourself not in order to get saved, but because you already are. And now you want to stay in step with Jesus and stay in tune with him. That's why we work out our salvation. That's why we push ourselves, ourselves to these spiritual doctrines. And there are many there are many that we can look at. Now, this we said is just an overview. We were looking at just the importance. Our time fails us to get into all these things. But I'd just like to um, classify them into a few of them. To just and, and this is just going to be mentioning them. Just a few of them. Um, you can look at inward disciplines, all right? Inward disciplines. I'm going to just classify them in about um, three. Inward disciplines, and I'm just mentioning them. The inward disciplines are those disciplines that you practice on the inside. Meditation, and we're not talking about Eastern meditation. The goal of Eastern meditation, when you're doing yoga, that's not what you're talking about. The goal of Eastern meditation is to empty the mind. The goal of Christian meditation, this spiritual discipline, is to fill the mind with one thought. You're allowing, let this one thought pervade your mind. Let this one thing fill me up until it goes down to the root of who I am. If I am meditating upon the word of God, I am taking this portion of scripture I am thinking about nothing else but this word. I am filling my being with it. I'm not trying to empty myself so that I can be decluttered. That's not it. If anything, in fact, let me then clutter myself with the word of God if there's such a thing. Right? So meditation. Prayer is another inward discipline. Fasting is another inward discipline. Study is another inward discipline. So meditation, prayer, study, um, fasting, those are inward disciplines. Those are things you do on the inside, all right? Now we look at outward disciplines. Outward disciplines are those things that we, we practice on the outside, that people can be able to see about us, okay? Those things, and all of these things, regardless whether they're inside or outside, they are those things that make us us. Things that make a believer a believer. That's why we call them the believer's practice. Outward disciplines include simplicity. Simplicity. You're not a complicated person. A believer is not called to be a complicated person. The Bible calls us and says in Thessalonians, this is First Thessalonians and 4, from verse 11, talks about how you should aspire to lead a quiet life. A quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands. Just simplicity. Believers are not supposed to be very complicated. That's why when you're not married and you're looking for somebody to marry, please look for a Christian, a believer, somebody who's not complicated. Mambo too simple. Mambo too simple. Simplicity. 
<laughs> Solitude is another one. Solitude. Solitude is where you, you go away by yourself. You spend time with yourself. That's what most of us are not practicing, that one. In this social media day and age, solitude also looks like getting off social media for some time. Just practice some solitude. It's a Christian spiritual discipline. Just be away. Because some zingin una bebo na onizawatu. Situ metoka kwa finance bill. Sasa situ na reject na kuyokupai. Sasa zingin ata ujuim. But why are we doing the things we are doing? Sometimes you don't even know. Eh, solitude will help you to get a mind of your own, the mind of Christ. Because sazingine una bebo tu na akili akili mtu public opinion ina kubeba oh we are going this way, we are going this way. oh we are going this way. hey just solitude submission is another one you submit to God and to the will of His word service is another one that people can be able to see God can be able to see you are serving the Lord outward disciplines then there are corporate disciplines and this is where I'm going to finish my time is up corporate disciplines corporate disciplines include confession. Those things that you do together with other believers. You can't confess by yourself to yourself. All right? You confess to somebody. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may find healing. Because it is the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. Confession. Worship is another one. Like what we have gathered here to do today. This... Um, by the way, worship can be both inward and corporate, okay? Worship can be both of those ones because uh, worship is this one. What we are doing here today, congregational worship, corporate worship is here, what we are doing here today. But then you are expected to live a life of worship. Um, is it Romans chapter 12 or Hebrews chapter 12? Um, that uh, therefore here is what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. This is your spiritual act of worship, you place your life before the Lord. You, the way you walk, the way you talk to your children, the way you talk to your spouse, the way you talk to your neighbors. I've given this example here many times. Nguo zimeanikwa huko juu. Umepata watu wameanika nguo kwa kamba zako na umeenda kuanika. How do you act as a believer? Unaziangusha zote chini unasema watu huku mmenizoea sana kwa hii plot. Mtu anunue kamba zake. Alafu huyo mtu anakuja kwa kanisa anakupata. Wewe ndio unaongoza hapa watu. Unasema come on lift up those holy hands. Sema which ones? So worship, ile nye unafanya kule na nye unafanya tukio hapa pamoja. Then the celebration is another one. I just take time to just enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the presence of the Lord. Now there are many of these things. But I finish by reading what the um, Apostle Paul says to Timothy. He says, now the Spirit expressly says in this latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving uh, spirits and to doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and so on and so forth. And he says all those things, explaining to um, the apostle, and he says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. These things are able to keep you in line, to make you more like Jesus, to preserve your life even for days without end. I want you to lift up your voice and for just a minute pray for yourself and ask that the Lord will help you as we start this journey of um, spiritual disciplines that you will also take an interest for yourself and just go into it and read it for yourself, study for yourself, try to understand, try to get resources, try to know what does the word say concerning these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for everyone that is lifting up their voice today. I pray that by the grace of God, you're going to help them, hold them by your victorious right hand. And Lord, it is us, we are the ones who are crying out to you that you would help us, that we will work ourselves and aim, strive further into growing into these spiritual dis disciplines because we have heard about their importance. These things will make us more like you. They would um, expand room inside of us for you. They will lead other people to you. The world will be filled with more Christ-like men and women if we actually practice these things. There are many importances of these things. My Father, I pray that you would help us to be doers, to be practicers of these things because you have called us to do it. That will not give in to every wind of doctrine and to the lie of the enemy in this day and age, but that, my Father, we would do the things that make us us. It will not leave room for the enemy to wash them away or to carry off us off away as slaves, but that you would help us, my Father, to guard these things, to practice them daily, that in the end we would be more like you. We thank you, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray.
In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you.